Hello everybody, Loremaster of Sotek here. Happy Halloween, first of all, for those of you who are excited for the holiday, and uh, good morning. So let's go ahead and just jump right into it with continuing the Greenskin Q&A as we slowly but surely slog our way towards completion. You know, I, I said on the first episode that I was like, oh, maybe like four weeks of this, and the more I'm getting a better idea about how many questions we can cover per video yeah <laughs> it's gonna be a while anyway let's go ahead and hop into it our first question comes from volrim who asks i wonder actually i know the green skins in the warhammer universe are creatures that grow out of shrooms but was that always the case or was it rewritten at some point so this kind of ties into a question we answered yesterday about if they're used if green skins were always non like only had a single gender or rather didn't have a concept of it so the answer is yeah there there used to be lore where there were male and female green skins and they had they were you know they were basically the orcs from lord of the rings in physiology to a lot of extent they were just more exaggerated but that was a really long time ago um at least probably like 20 years now and games workshop altered that a super duper long time ago to where they're now humanoid fungi creatures that are probably one of the more fascinating physical beings in the warhammer universe but um yeah so let's head on to the next question from daniel green who asks do greenskins use teeth as currency if so are there goblin shopkeepers that stay in business without getting beaten by every orc customer are there any uh, mercenaries, which we'll cover that more on a different day, but, and then could a local noble with a beast man problem tell the local war boss that a brave shaman insulted his favorite squig to start a war? So, focusing on the more cultural aspect, yes, teeth, or which teeth, but of course Greenskins pronounce it T-E-E-F, is the main currency among most Greenskins because Greenskins are able to grow their teeth back very, very quickly and and many of them kind of it for them it's just a simplified currency that they all have access to and surprisingly there are greenskins who do function as shopkeepers they're rare but they do exist for instance after the black orc rebellion in czar nagrand and all the black orcs pretty much scattered or a lot of greenskins got ejected from the capital of the chaos wars and scattered to the four winds a lot of the orcs who had grown up in Tsar Nagrand were taught by the Chaos Dwarves the very basic fundamentals of blacksmithing and how, in, and how to work iron. And they took that knowledge with them to the rest of the Warhammer world. And they start, and that's when we started getting our more common greenskins today who use, you know, who wear armor and have metal weapons and stuff like that. That's why if you leave the... If, if you leave the main supermass continent of the old world and all of its, you know, the old world, the Southlands and everything to the east, if you go to the western continent, there are very, very few normal orcs or black orcs. Almost everything in the new world are savage orcs or forest goblins. You know, just the most basic, super basic type of greenskins. Um, it has gotten more diverse over the years as there have been orc fleets that have gone from the west to the, uh, from the east to the west. But for the most part in the old world is where we have our common green skins tend to be like more civilized. Like they have leather armor or, you know, they have leather armor and clothing. They have many of them wear helmets or, you know, have shoulder pads made of metal or iron. They have iron weapons, all that stuff. And that came across because of greenskin weaponsmiths that the Chaos Dwarves unwittingly unleashed upon the rest of the world. So most camps or most tribes have something similar to a smith. It, <laughs> calling them smiths is very generous, but they do exist. And in greenskin culture, you generally don't want to mess with that greenskin because they're so vital to the lifeblood of the tribe that generally messing with them is going to is going to piss off whoever the war boss is or at least some of the regular bosses and if you make a war boss mad the first thing they're going to do is kill you and they're probably going to make it really slow and really painful 
So in green skin culture, you're, there are shopkeeps. They're very rare, but they do exist. And it is, it is where a lot of that currency is spent and used. But you might travel a distance to find a camp that specializes in it. Because, for instance, Carrick Eight Peaks or Black Crag or um, a lot of the green... Or uh, just any of the major greenskin settlements, which there are more outside of those too, um, if you travel through the Badlands and the mountains, those a lot of those greenskins have what you could call artisans. And you will... Orcs and goblins will travel great distances to meet with them to get weapons and armor, especially if they're planning for a big raid... Or maybe they've just been very successful in absorbing other tribes and they're building up for a war or whatever that's going to be. As for the other two questions, the, we're going to focus in on them really, really hard. We're going to have a whole ser probably series of days dedicated to the concept of greenskin mercenaries and how greenskins feel towards other races and how they can be manipulated by them. So, I'm not going to get super in-depth, but I'm just going to say, are there greenskin mercenaries? No, not really. Um, there were back in the Dog of Wars days, Dog of War days of Warhammer Fantasy, but the reason you, very, you never see the Dogs of War talked about anymore in Warhammer literature is because the Dogs of War are inherently super-duper goofy. Most of them are very, very silly, or they have, like, really bizarre, exaggerated curses or abilities or powers that kind of gave a hand wave reason about how they existed in the first place and a lot of them just kind of got shoved out of the universe canon so you know they they existed at a point and games workshop would probably say oh yeah they technically exist i guess but in any of the more in any, like, established storyline of the Warhammer Fantasy Universe, the Dogs of War functionally do not exist. Um, just because, outside of, like, Tilia and Nostalia, but the more exotic ones, like Tichi Huichi's Raiders, Long Drong Slayer Pirates, um, I forget what their name is, but there's uh, an undead warband where, like, everybody they kill gets resurrected. Those guys don't really exist in the modern lore. Just because... They, they kind of break the understanding laws of the universe and they had the lore for them was super out of its way to justify their existence. So there were greenskin mercenaries once upon a time, but in the modern in the modern canon, no, they don't exist. Greenskins are way too unreliable. As for could you manipulate a local boss into fighting the beastmen? Theoretically, yes, but it would be very, very hard. Because contrary to some contrary to some understanding, there are actually a lot of languages in the Warhammer Fantasy universe. And talking to an orc or a goblin is super duper difficult. Because their language is it's very difficult to understand. Because learning it in the first place requires you getting a goblinoid or greenskin that's willing to teach you. Which is virtually impossible most of the time. You know, what something that makes Scar Snake super duper special is that Scar Snake can actually understand and speak a ton of different languages. Like, he understands Kozilid loosely. You know, he can speak Reichspiel, even though he's kind of got a heavy accent. And the way he speaks it is, of course, the way Greenskins would speak Reichspiel, so it sounds kind of silly. But, like, that's a big deal for Scar Snake is that he can actually br breach that communication barrier. <laughs> Although. For like Total War and video games, they do a much more simplified version of their languages, you know, where Greenskins will speak English. If you had like a absolutely true to canon game, Greenskins don't speak Reichspiel. They speak a totally unique language. So just having a conversation with a Greenskin to say, hey, that shaman over there was talking crap about you or those beastmen, go fight them and I'll pay you. Just getting to that point is virtually impossible. Unless you're dealing with someone who has a bizarrely innate and deep knowledge of greenskins. So, hopefully that answers that. Batcal123 asks, how territorial are greenskins? As in, do different tribes have their own territory and borders? Are there some nomadic greenskins? Or is the Badlands mostly just open to all greenskins to wander across? So, it depends on the tribe and the region. Most greenskins are very, very territorial, and they contest very heavily over certain locations. So if you're playing Total War Warhammer, 
um, Def Gorge, which is in the bottom right of the Badlands. It's it's like right at the bottom where the World's Edge Mountains touch the Badlands before you get to the Southlands or like the deserts. Def Gorge is actually this massive graveyard where Greenskins have been fighting each other for millennia over it because of its strategic importance and because so many Greenskins have died there, the amount of equipment available if you control that zone your tribe is ridiculously powerful so there's like tons of loot and there's a lot of glory that comes from owning it but it's almost always changing hands because it's such a violent place because greenskins do not share space very nicely there have to be i wouldn't call them trees but there have to be understandings and like deals that are worked out between tribes for them to have a border that works out really well but um as far as nomadic tribes are concerned there are nomadic tribes. They're they're not crazy common compared to tribes that have an established land. Most tribes have like a home base where there's like they they are they know where sports are going to come out and they know how to get fresh recruits and all this stuff and they know the lay of the land. Um, but some tribes are very very nomadic. For instance, if you go out to the Wolflands, um, which is on the other side of the World's Edge Mountains from the Old World. All of the wolf goblin tribes are very, very nomadic. Like, they're constantly moving around. Whereas, if you go maybe into, like, the southern badlands, where you're going to find a lot of savage orcs, they tend to be extremely nomadic as well. And that is mostly due to how hostile their environment is. Basically, if the greenskins cannot successfully forage food very well, then they're going to be nomadic most of the time. So, the greenskins that live in the mountains tend to be stationary. The greenskins that live in like the open wastelands of like the wolflands or the darklands or the badlands, they're going to be nomadic. Um, but when it comes to ter like territory disputes, that happens a lot. And greenskins have a very, after some particularly enterprising greenskins kind of figured out the understanding of it, a ton of greenskins are now are in the, are in the habit of basically charging you to charging other tribes to pass through their lands for you know you have to pay them a certain amount of loot or teeth in order for to move through their lands without them attacking you but it's really rare for that to actually go off according to plan because most green skins will just immediately attack each other so um by the time a tribe is like hey if you want to move through our land you got to pay us x amount the other tribe will be like ah screw you and they just immediately start fighting so that it, it, it happens, but uh, most tribes can't enforce that very well. The only tribes that really successfully enforce like extortions to move through their lands or tolls are really, really powerful fortresses that have huge armies and defensive capabilities like Gorfang Rotgut up in Black Crag or the orcs outside of the orcs that you can find in Mount Grimfang. Or, you know, uh, the goblins of Red Eye Mountain. All those guys can be a little more... They, they can throw their weight around. But, yeah. Um, outside of that, um, there are... Uh, so, yeah, greenskins do tend to wander a fair bit. But if you're a greenskin tribe and you're wandering, they you have to know where the other tribes are. And you have to have... An understanding of what you're going to be dealing with because the last thing you want to do is like be traveling south and then get in a fight with the savage orcs of the top knots tribe and all of a sudden they're, and they're just like way bigger than you are and you just get wiped out that happens to a lot of really bad decision making orcs but most of the time green skins are going to be fairly stationary or they're at least going to have a territory that they roam around as opposed to just wandering purely openly because you you can't just go through the badlands you're gonna attract attention always unless you're very very stealthy our next question comes from sinclair hado who asked does a goblin accept the inherent inferiority of goblins to orcs or do they need to be affirmatively forced into the subservient role do they ever betray their overlords out of pure spite and can a goblin be bribed by say a human to save them from the orcs in return for tons of gold and plunder so goblins never ever ever accept their lot in life if they can think of a way to worm out of it they are acutely aware of the fact that orcs are much bigger and stronger than them 
but goblins are much craftier and sneakier and there's a reason for that it's a survival adaption um goblins very rarely will openly well goblins in a group will happily antagonize some orcs because they reliably think they can get away from them but a a single goblin who doesn't have like shaman powers or isn't a boss of some sort is very rarely going to just talk crap to the nearest orc, uh, at least openly. That being said, the thing that goblins are particularly nasty about is that they hold grudges really, really well, and they are constantly plotting to get back at you or cut you down. So, like, an orc boss is not ever going to... Very rarely will face an open challenge from a goblin. And... Most goblin tribes that have like a goblin war boss either don't have orc components or the orc components they do have are very, very small because orcs really don't like taking orders from goblins because orcs are very pure in their sense of might makes right and that you should be able to beat the crap out of everyone in your tribe to show that you're boss. Goblins don't necessarily follow that rule. Um, they rely on a lot more tricky schemes. So like if an orc's going to go at a goblin boss to try and challenge him, a lot of those goblins will rely on really sneaky tactics or some kind of muscle. Like a fair amount of goblin tribes have a goblin boss that's very friendly and spoils the trolls. And they use the trolls like bodyguards. So the trolls will like just kill any orc that tries to mess with them. Or you might have, a, you know, if you're dealing with the spider tribes, then you have goblins that are tribes that tend to be pure goblins so they don't have that problem or if you're out in the wolf lands you'll be dealing with goblins who are so fast and terrifying on their mounts that they can easily harass an orc to death or their wolf can just tear it apart so um so that so with all that said you know goblins do not accept their role and if they get the chance they will kill an orc every time no problem goblins their favorite thing to do in life is to torture things whether it's animals, orcs, snotlings, humans, dwarves. Goblins have a deep, deep love of just horrible, horrible acts of torture. So you're not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna find a goblin that if given the chance to take down something bigger than them would not jump at it. But as far as the last question is concerned, um, as crafty as a goblin is, I'm sure that there could be a situation where a human could try and bribe a goblin to turn against his tribe but to say that they would be unreliable allies is a bold understatement and once again there's a really hard communication barrier you know there's there's a lot of stories about skaven and humans talking to each other and working out these really nasty deals where they kind of uh, you know, they bribe each other to turn on each other or allow each other, you know, they kind of work out a system, but that's because Skaven actively pursue that relationship and learn to speak Reichspiel so they can understand and communicate with humans and try and manipulate them. Um, goblins don't bother with that because most goblins either A, don't live that long or B, are way too stupid to think that far ahead. Um, if there's one thing that Skaven have going for them is they're, they're great schemers. Goblins are not very good schemers. Um, they're just, they're just cruel, but hopefully that if, if a human could speak to a goblin and did have something the goblin was interested in, you better bet your butt. He would gladly turn on an orc war boss, but that goblin would be spending the entire time in that relationship trying to double cross you. So wouldn't be worth it. In my opinion, Hugh white has three quick questions here. Are there any Black Orc boar boys? If not, why not? And do Chaos Dwarves have the typical dwarf attitude towards animals? So, that last question is kind of random, but we have a couple of those in these. So, uh, first question, no. There is no, like, organized group of Black Orc boar bosses. And that tends to be just because Black Orcs are so big and so heavy in all their armor that boars just don't have a realistic chance of carrying them around like it's just it's just there are there aren't any pigs that are big enough until age of sigmar to carry around orcs that heavily armored it's just not a it's just not a it's just a it's just a weight it's just a mathematical thing um as far 
um that being said there are black orcs who are fond enough of boars that they set up like boar chariots so if you're gonna have black orcs being having a relationship with boars or being mounted with a boar involved it's almost 99.9 to the infinite times it's gonna be because they're on a boar chariot so there's gonna be two at least two boars pulling a chariot that has a black orc on it and it's and he's gonna be a boss because no regular black orcs can usually pull that off you have to have some clout in order to be cool and individualistic like that um because the chariot would have to be like reinforced and a bunch of other nonsense and they'd have to hire an orc who understands how to drive a chariot and all that crap um so that that's why you don't see them primarily um on for the last question do chaos dwarves share the typical attitude uh chaos dwarves don't trust animals just like dwarves don't so there's no like mounted chaos dwarf units they have bull centaurs but those are totally different those are like a religious those are more of like a religious shock troop that are centaurs so they're part animal so that kind of like answers that for them um as for like their attitude towards animals chaos dwarves just are horribly cruel to everything and because they learned how to get ogres and orcs to pull their war machines and also they invented war machines that can like act as their baggage trains which are called iron demons and they're very very scary they're basically trains that have a demonic intelligence controlling them uh <laughs> chaos dwarves don't really have a use for animals outside of like doing absolutely horrible things to them or maybe it's just beasts of burden to log around stuff in the actual cities but no, they're not any nicer or they don't use animals more than you would see regular dwarves using them. Next up is Danier, who asks, as compared to other races, how susceptible are greenskins to disease, both natural and that of Nurgle? Do the chaos gods give the greenskins any particular attention? Thinking about what I said regarding about how Nurgle hates dwarves in particular for their resilience. So when it comes to natural diseases, Greenskins are fairly resistant to it just because they're really tough and their physiology is a little more complicated than most other species. So for a disease to hop the physical barrier from infecting a regular host, like an animal based host, like a human or an animal or a beast man or a skaven or whatever, to jump from that to infecting a greenskin, which are more of these brutish humanoid fungi creatures, um, it's a bit of a leap. But it, it happens. There are diseases that can infect greenskins. And when greenskins do get sick from something that's capable of infecting them, it spreads like wildfire because greenskins are very nasty creatures. But for the most part, they're fairly immune to almost every natural disease on the Warhammer planet. That being said, Nurgle has no problem. And Clan Pestilence as well. They have very little issues infecting greenskins. Um, the reason that dwarves are hated by Nurgle is not, it, it, it is because they're so resilient, but a big part of that is dwarves have a very natural, innate resistance to magic. And every disease that Nurgle concocts is magical in origin because it's, it comes from the realm of chaos and everything in the, the realm of chaos is literally just magic made physical. It's, you know, it's magic made manifest. So that's kind of why he hates the dwarves so much is that they have like a super unique resistance. Greenskins do not have that magical resistance at all. So anything that Nurgle cooks up in his cauldron and just tosses at the greenskins is going to be devastating for them. So, um, and if anything, it spreads easier because of what I said earlier, because, you know, greenskins have little issue about defecating everywhere and they use their dung as like a major building material and all this other crap like that so um, as far as do any of the chaos gods pay them any particular attention not really um the gods the chaos gods in warhammer fantasy are very big on only paying attention to individuals that they see a potential benefit of it from so like the chaos gods don't care about you unless your belief in them is something that will particularly sate them like your soul is something they want Greenskins are so, like, fully dedicated and pigeonholed into Gork and Mork and the Spider God a little bit for Forest Goblins. Um, and for Night Goblins, they kind of have the Bad Moon, though that builds into Gork and Mork. 
that like green skins are just useless to the, the gods of chaos. You know, corn, I'm sure of the gods, corn probably enjoys them the most because they're just so incredibly violent. And wherever they go, they spread violence and they shed tons and tons of blood. So I'm sure from that aspect, Korn appreciates Greenskins, but he doesn't care about them. And he doesn't pay them any particular mind or heed. You know, the only thing that can be said about Orcs is that the mortal followers of Chaos, um, especially Cornate followers, tend to really like Greenskins because they're, they know... At least for orcs, they know there's not going to be a lot of shenanigans. It's just going to be like two armies slamming into each other and going at it. So there is an appreciation there, and it's mutual because the greenskins, orcs in particular, are very fond of Warriors of Chaos on average because they tend to think it's a really good fight. So, but when it comes to the gods, nah, the 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 major powers in the realm of chaos could not give two farts about orcs or greenskins. Uh, our next question comes in from Sinclair Hado, who asks, If I locked a greenskin in a cage with no sunlight, food, or water, could they survive? I know that greenskins seem to thrive off fighting itself, so could a pair of entombed but fighting greenskins survive longer than a single one on their own? So, to the first question, no. Greenskins, they do have physical needs that need to be fed. They do need to eat. They do need to drink. They do... You know, they need to move. They need to breathe. If they don't have those things going for them, they're going to die. Um, you know, they need to not get too cold or too hot, you know. So if, if you put a green skin in a cage and he doesn't get fed or he doesn't have, not necessarily water, but something to drink, he's going to die pretty quick. Um, you know, just as quick as most. Like, he, he'd probably, an orc would probably last a good while, but a goblin, is, goblins would die super fast. Orcs would die not too long after that. They're tough, but they're not invincible. Um, and could they thrive while fighting itself? No. Um, th they do have physical needs that need to be met. They, they do have physical systems that need to be kept going. If you put two orcs in a cage, they would one of them would thrive because he would kill the other orc and he would be able to eat him and like use him as nourishment until he ran out of him and then he would die. <laughs> so, no. They... They would not do very well in that scenario. Um, you know, there are, there are of course, green skins that thrive without some of those elements necessarily. You know, you have the green skins in the desert, like savage orcs, who tend to do okay without having large bodies of water and stuff. Um, no, I would say that when it comes to water, green skins tend to uh, seem to get away with not needing it nearly as much as other species. But they're going to get a lot of that nourishment through, like, eating the people they kill and drinking their blood and other nonsense. Um, not in the sense of like a vampire sense, but just in a sense of like sating their thirst. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, next up we have Adam Sagala who asks, doesn't, how does an orc or shaman or how does an orc or goblin become a shaman? And how are the rituals and traditions associated with worshiping Gork and Mork? Are there, are the green skins, very religious and what do the greenskins do when they encounter foreign shrines that are not they not their own do they simply destroy them or do they defile them to show that their gods are stronger so first part of the question is the way you become a shaman is you just you just become like you just are born as one it's very similar to the way humans work you cannot with very rare exception you cannot learn magic you, you either have an innate connection to it or you don't. It is very like boom, boom. Um, elves have a lot more of a... Elves have a much more nuanced relationship with magic because they are inherently magical beings. Um, but like when it comes to greenskins, they're much like humans. Either you were born knowing how to do magic or you weren't. The only being in all of existence who did not have an aptitude for magic but forced himself to learn it through sheer willpower was Setra the Imperishable. Um, and he sucks at magic. <laughs> like, Setra knows enough that he understands it and he can use it and he can, like, deflect a little bit. But, like, as far as, like, the levels of wizards go, Setra is, like, a total... He's the bottom of the tier when it comes to casting magic. Setra is a horrible wizard. But the fact that he knows any magic is, like, amazing. But for greenskins, you either know it or you don't. When you're born, 
they would have an innate connection to the, the great green or the realm, the winds of magic and that would manifest super duper quickly so they would be like unleashing magic almost the instant they were born and when that happens they're pretty much immediately set aside to go learn from the nearest shaman and if there isn't one um thankfully for green skins just by tapping into the realms of magic just having that physical connection causes them to have access to basically all of the racial memory of green skin kind so they can just learn everything from that um when it comes to like rituals and traditions uh, it depends on the tribe a lot of tribes have really goofy traditions or uh rituals that they've just kind of built up over time for instance there's a tribe called the um, red cloud goblins and the red cloud goblins their shamans use their magic to purposefully turn a, like half of their body red in color just that's just because like that's just what they do and that happens with a lot of tribes a lot of tribes just have really goofy rituals because either something happened once and someone in their tribe was like you know they like won a big battle and somebody or someone in their tribe did something amazing and there just happened to be something going on with that and the the greenskins were like because he was half red like clearly that's where his source of power came from and so it just like spreads to becoming a tradition in that tribe um there are not any rituals and traditions that are like for all greenskins it just depends on their local culture as for are they very religious um kind of greenskins are all a hundred percent religious in that they 100 percent believe in gork and mork uh, which is most everything in the Warhammer world. There, there are no atheists in the Warhammer world because the gods actually do things. <laughs> you know, in our world, it there's a lot of philosophy behind if there is a god or many gods or no gods, you know. And, and it's there's no way to prove anything 100% definitively because gods don't actually do anything in our world that's super overt and obvious. In Warhammer, you can literally, like, yell at a god, and if you piss them off, they will smite your ass in front of everybody, no problem. Um, like, you don't talk about the dark gods in civilized society in the Empire, not because it's considered impolite, but because if you say their name, you risk drawing their attention to you, and bad things will happen. Like, demons will manifest and murder the shit out of you to claim your soul, or if the witch hunters hear you talking about it, they will just, you're like, heretic! Because you're literally asking for things to happen at that point. So, are the Greenskins very religious? 100%. But their religion, Greenskins believe that the best way to appease Gork and Mork, so the best way to, like, worship, is just to be themselves. Like, by just enjoying violence, um, tearing down crap, indulging in destruction, that is worshipping Gork and Mork. So they don't do anything extra as part of religion. They just do what they want. And to them, to Gork and Mork, that is like, that's, that's it. That's all you got to do to please Gork and Mork is be a green skin. You know, be, be brutally cunning or cunningly brutal. Be one of those, you're, you're golden. Um, and then the last question, uh, oh yeah, we're out of time. So the last part of this question is what do they do when they encounter foreign shrines? Um, always greenskins defile greenskins view other gods as weak and like a joke and greenskins like to challenge things um, no matter what it is so like greenskins will happily call out the dark gods and throw shit at them literally and do anything they can to try and piss off other religions because they're trying to start a fight uh, and to them that's like that's the best thing in the universe so they will they go ham in starting fights with other, other religions so every single time they manage to capture an enemy shrine or something it, it doesn't even have to be a shrine if they capture any aspect of enemy civilization they're gonna change it to look more like the way they like it so you know if they take over a dwarf karak they're gonna smash the faces of all the statues they're gonna tear down everything that is written and all the tapestries they're gonna deface them with dung and blood and corpses and entrails and every statue and anything they can't destroy they're gonna try and like put something on it that makes it look more like gork and mork 
So they're gonna like carve the stone to look like an orc face. Or they're gonna make these giant um, wooden faces that, you know, or that typical... You know, whenever you look at a green skin flag and almost all of them have that like goofy face where it's like the goofy eyes and the big grinning fang filled mouth. That is basically the sign of Gork and Mork. And they'll just make those and just plaster them everywhere. And it's partway because it's a, a it's a direct challenge... And it's because they deface it to show that they're better. They're stronger. They won. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully that answers all of your questions. So, that's another day down. I will. I hope you all have a great Halloween, whatever it is you're doing. And have a great day. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye, guys.